<laughs> awesome. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar today on e-commerce. Very exciting, huge growth area. Super excited to kind of delve in and, and chat about it more. Um, I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes just to any like kind of last minute people joining and then we will do a bit of an introduction to Emmy and Rob and myself um, and then we're just going to dive in and have a great chat about how you grow start and grow an e-commerce business <laughs> hey everyone lovely to see you all here it's nice for everyone to come and join us on a Tuesday lunchtime because I think we are all aware everyone's super busy and probably got Christmas presents to buy and all kinds of things to do. So we really appreciate you turning up today. Cool. Should we do a little, should we do a little introduction then? Yes, let's do it. Cool. Well, I will start. Um, so I'm Emmy Faust. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur turned growth consultant. Um, I've been in digital and marketing for oh, like over 20 years now, um, set up and scaled and sold my own businesses in marketing and media sort of tech space. Um, I've been on Dragon's Den, secured £200,000 in funding. At the time, it was the biggest ever um, investment, um, single investment, but I'm sure loads of people since then, that was ages ago, I'm sure loads of people have gone on to, to raise a lot more than, than I did. Um, and I now work with mainly um, early stage businesses, um, businesses that have got funding and I help them put together a growth strategy and a plan for success. Um, and I'm also board advisor to various um, businesses as well. So absolutely love what I do, love sharing my insight. And I'm super excited to be here today with Rob and Emily to answer all your questions and to share some um, insights and thoughts and ideas as to how you can scale your business. So thank you for inviting me, Emily. No problem. Really great to have you on board. Emily's got some amazing experience. So um it's awesome to kind of get you on and share some of that with everybody. Um, Rob, would you, would you want to do an intro to yourself? Of course. Um, so I'm Rob Wilson. Um, I head up uh, the portfolio team at Outfund. Um, we're a revenue-based finance provider, so work with lots of e-commerce and SaaS businesses and um, help them to grow and scale. Uh, previously worked at Cedars, uh, so very familiar with, with crowdfunding. Um, and prior to that, ran a marketing agency that, that specialised in uh, sort of working with e-commerce businesses um, and helping them to, to raise money at the sort of the early stage. So very excited to, uh, to be here today and to, to share the, the sort of experience and knowledge that I've sort of gained over the uh, past few years. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Rob, you're quite quiet. I don't know if, if you could somehow turn up your volume. Uh, sure. um, Emily, are you going to you, you, let us know about you because you've got an interesting background as well, haven't you? I do, yeah. So I, I, I'm Emily. Hi, everyone. I have just recently joined Cedars as new head of partnerships. Um, but my background is also in kind of entrepreneurship and starting a business. So I, before joining Cedars, co-founded a business with my husband called Fitch, which is a drinks brand, and we sell online and we sell in retail and, and all over. So I have been through the experience of both setting up a business and going through the kind of online side and, and understanding the D2C side. So yeah, I'm also excited to kind of share my experience with that alongside obviously the um, understanding of Cedars and what we do and how we support e-commerce businesses in their funding journey. So we, we've actually done some really brilliant e-commerce um, businesses at, at Cedars from the likes of the vegan kind to Heights. Um, but we've done Lick, which is a, an awesome paint company, which I've just ordered some for my house. Um, so yeah, we, we're quite experienced with, with doing kind of online business raises. So I'm going to share a bit about how that funding journey looks when, you, when you're doing an online business. Yeah. I, um, I interviewed... Um... Dan from Heights for my podcast actually and talked to him about his experience and he crowdfunded did he hit his target in 20 minutes it was like he hit his target in no time at all didn't he yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, brilliant it's an awesome business so it makes sense <laughs> yeah really really good so that that would be that would be a good little story to to talk about yeah yeah definitely um well I thought the, the way we could do it would be to kind of talk about the journey somebody would go on when kind of setting up an online business and then what that looks like throughout the journey in terms of their growth and how they go to scale that and what at what point do you look at funding uh is it relevant to you as an online business and what are the options available um as well as the little 
tips and tricks to how you grow and, and scale your online business. So um, I thought we'd kind of jump in right at the start um, and looking at kind of, yeah, I, I think for me personally, um, kind of going on the Fitch journey with setting up an online business, uh, I could see the huge benefits of kind of starting it and selling through that model of D2C. But I think as a first time entrepreneur and, and somebody um, coming at it with absolutely no knowledge, it can also be an absolute minefield. Um, you know, where do you start? You know, what do you need to do? What agencies and freelancers do you need to get on board? Um, what tools do you need to use? There's, there's so many questions um, and kind of unlocking that and understanding just what the first touch point is, um, is I think really important. So it'd be great to understand from both of you um, what you think is um, the important things to look at right at the start of the journey in terms of when you're setting up an online business. Okay. Yeah. yeah go for it. So I would say, well, whatever business you're setting up, okay, so whether it's online, offline, whatever, you know, you've got to get the fundamentals right, because um, essentially, if you don't, you could be wasting a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money. And, and unfortunately, lots of businesses don't succeed. And I think you can give yourself such a great chance of succeeding if you get the fundamentals right. So I would say before you even think about, you know, whether you're going to use Shopify or WordPress or all those things, you know, you actually need to make sure that you've got something that customers want. So I think it's about researching your, it's about doing that research, isn't it? It's about talking to people. It's about finding your customers. It's about um, seeing if there are people that want to buy this product before you even are necessarily selling it online. See if you've got friends or, you know, people locally. And if, if everyone's saying, wow, this is amazing. I love it. How do I buy one for my friend? You kind of know that you're setting yourself up for success. So I think one of the first things I'd say is a customer centric company. And that's so important. It's thinking about how they can serve their customers, what their customers wants are, what their customer needs are and what their customers want to buy rather than just, creating something that they think people want so I think that's kind of a fundamental is to make sure you have got a product that, that people want to buy and that you've done that research you've talked to customers that you've um, listened to them because that research is going to give you so much insight into your marketing messages into your pricing into how you're going to sell it where you're going to sell it um, and the more that you can understand your audience you can then understand the other basics like how to position yourself in the market um, and who you're going to sell to and that to know you've got the right products because you don't want to invest time and money in setting up a big sort of, not a big, even a small e-commerce operation if you haven't got those fundamentals right because you're then going to have to change it all. Um, and one last thing I would add, because I was just doing an interview with an e-commerce um, business earlier, is I do think it's really important that you've got an understanding of your mission, your vision and your values and, and your, you know, your brand, some of the basics before you sort of go and jump, jump, jump out and start spending money on those things, because those are things that are, are really critical to success. So, so for me, I would say before you start setting up your Shopify or your WordPress site or doing anything like that, make sure you've thought about all those fundamentals. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think it's a bit that's often missed or overlooked a little bit more than it should be. Um, I think it's it's just such an important piece. And it's not to say you can't then change things and iterate. And that, I think that's also equally very important is to constantly, even after you've launched, be constantly looking at getting that feedback and and changing if you need to. But doing that fundamental piece at the beginning where it's you know finding out who your customers are, what they're actually saying about your product or service, um, what do they want from you will really help you define, um, you know, where you need to go and, and what tools you need to set up, what um, presence you're going to be have, like, is it going to be Instagram or Pinterest or um, LinkedIn, depending on who your um, market is. And I think just understanding that piece at the beginning will just make the journey so much easier. Yeah. Sure, I'll just echo that. I mean, um, can everyone hear me okay better now, actually? Is that yeah. Okay, it's, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I, I'd, I'd echo that. I think, you know, most important thing is having that, that product market fit. There's lots of ways you can do that. Rewards-based crowdfunding can be a great tool to use to assess the market, to get your product out there, get that early feedback and really start engaging with your, your target market. Um, Another thing that I, I would strongly recommend is just making sure that you've gone through the financials and you understand the margin. You make sure that from day one, this, this product has the potential to be profitable. 
Um, you see lots of businesses that, you know, sort of miss, miss that at that point. They don't do enough research and understand, you know, the, the raw sort of cost of materials and actually shipment and everything else that goes into it. Um, and then later on down the line, they start to have issues. Um, so it's really important that, you know, from day one, you do your research, understand what your margins are, how you're going to get it, you know, sort of to market and making sure that you factor in all the sort of variable costs, how much it's going to cost to acquire, um, you know, your customers, what platform are you going to use, platform fees. Um, you know, recently Amazon announced they're actually going to increase their, their seller fees next year. Um, so there's always things you need to sort of take into account at that early stage and you want to try and do it, you know, uh, as, as an MVP, you want to try and test and be lean. Um, and then from there, you can sort of decide to, to scale and, and build. I was just going to say something, Rob, that you said there that was really interesting. Um, and I have seen this with founders that like have come to me and they've got their funding um, is that piece of work is so important to like literally, you know, cost out what everything is going to be because, and I think some, another thing that people often might forget, especially if you haven't gone to sort of like an accountant to help you do your, your business planning, things like that, you know, you're going to have to charge your customer that they don't see that. So if you're, you know, if you're selling it at £24, if I am hope I'm doing my VAT correctly here, you're actually only getting £20 plus £4 VAT. So, you, you know, I've seen founders that are using that £24 in their calculations and they haven't actually realised that £4 of that's going to go to the VAT man. They've only got £20 to play with. So I think that's really, really important. And, and also don't underestimate the cost of acquiring a customer and the direct cost of that. And, and then, you know, you've got all your other marketing as well that you might not attribute to, to your cost per acquisition, like your, you know, your the branding costs and the PR costs and all of those, and it can really add up. And I, I think you're so right, Rob, that, you know, you want to get a, you want to make sure what price you're putting out there is actually something that's going to be profitable long term and that you're not going to have all your margins taken away when you suddenly remember you've got to pay for postage, packaging, logistics, warehouses and all those other things that come in, don't they? Yeah. Oh, Rob, Rob, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, and just on that point, in terms of logistics, which has been a nightmare over the last year with all the you know logistics sort of crisis. Um, as an example, you know, we've got one client who used to pay about sort of two thousand dollars for a container, and you know, at its peak, it went up to about twenty five thousand dollars. <gasps> wow. Um, so you know, things like that, obviously, out of your your control, and uh, it's been interesting. You know, the last year. Uh, clients have either decided to absorb that cost or they've decided to increase prices or prices will be uh, increasing uh, sort of in the new year. Um, but it's just making sure that you have, you know, at least some form of buffer for these eventualities that, that may arise. And, and another thing as well, um, I remember when we were running our media agency and it's slightly different now because you just got the euro and dollars, but we were buying media in like 10 different um, currencies and those currency rates were changing by like 10 15 percent sometimes um, and you know we had to pre-buy currency in advance to you know keep that rate so we knew so that's another thing if you're buying stock from other countries you know the if the exchange rate moves 10 or 15 percent you've got to put that into your margins as well or otherwise you need to buy the currency up front to secure that rate in um but you know we had some years we actually ended up making loads of money on our currency but other years we ended up losing it so i, I think that's another thing that people often don't sort of factor into the equation yeah i think we need to look at doing um a bit of a, a topic and another webinar around um international expansion um and understanding kind of currency variations and because that's like a i think a whole topic <laughs> Oh, yeah no. definitely <laughs> definitely idea, there's so many things aren't there and I think like when you first set up your business and you've got this great idea for a product and um, that you want to sell and hopefully you know you've got people who are buying it and um, you don't know about these things because you you're new to setting up a business so you know you might not even know that about often lots of people who set up a business don't know the rules with that or they don't haven't realized that there's going to be all these additional costs so um yeah, I mean, I suppose we could put together a resource, couldn't we, like a che checklist or something at some point, and then we could share that about things to think about in those early stages. Absolutely. Um, it'd be great. We, we've had a question come in, and please do um, feel free to answer, ask questions throughout this. Um, 
as we go, we've got there's a question at Q&A and a chat box uh, below, so please feel free. And also afterwards, we love feedback. So anybody who has any feedback on this session or what you'd like to see from us going forward or what you find useful, we would love to hear it. So please do let us know. Um, someone's asked around, um, are they right to classify a typical airline or a train network website on which we uh, which one can buy a ticket as an e-commerce website. So I guess it would be good to just um, explain um, what is classified as an online business um, and what is not. Um, so a bit of a definition around that. Um, what, what would you say, Rob? Because I, 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 when I think e-commerce, I'm always thinking products. And I suppose this is like, you're not actually selling products, sending products, are you? You're just buying a, a ticket. Um, would you classify that as e-commerce? So, I mean, for us in terms of out funds, so we work with online businesses as, a, as an umbrella. So as long as the business is generating their revenue online through a card processor, we can support them. Um, I guess, you know, in, in its, in its uh, truest sense, e-commerce is more, you know, physical products selling, sold online, I would, I would say. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the things that, that we're talking about and we'll be talking about, you know, relevant across all different types of online businesses. Yeah. I think that isn't it I mean I work with service-based businesses I work with e-commerce based businesses um I think a lot of the things that we're talking about today are relevant to lots of businesses and then obviously there's going to be some things that we talk about which are you know pertinent especially to, to people selling products um you know like the logistics that we're talking about in the warehouse but the sort of fundamentals that we're talking about um are fundamentals for any online business aren't they getting those fundamentals right yeah, and I think, you know, with with COVID happening um, and the way we're moving um, as generally as a human race towards, um, you know, a faster lifestyle and our want and need for doing things kind of quicker and, and far more online based um, for, for businesses having that online ability to sell directly to consumer in some way um, is just, I think, imperative now more than more than ever so um yeah it i think it definitely covers off uh, not just your typical f and b or, or, or product anymore it, it's a lot more than that um mm. so i guess we, this kind of moves us on a little bit to um once the business is up and running once you've done this kind of initial um, understanding of your business and, and you've got your plan in place and you uh, potentially created an online store or you've got your website um, what does a business need to do from there in order to look at growing and scaling um, and you know how do they go about finding the right people to work with and um, at what point I guess we can we can have a little bit of a chat about what time is relevant to fund if it's relevant at all to your business so um, I guess both to both of you you know what what do you think a business needs to do in order to to look at kind of growing and scaling sure so i mean i, I can kick things off from a from a funding perspective so i guess at that very early stage you know typically businesses um are self-funded so you know the founder has some savings or access to to capital for maybe their own network to be able just to get off the ground and get to that sort of mvp stage as we discussed doing doing the research bringing something out maybe it might be a prototype to your target market getting that feedback um at which point you know you have enough uh, sort of traction to uh, potentially do uh, an equity round or a crowdfunding round um i'd say you know initially rewards based crowdfunding for e-commerce brands is a great way to be able to raise some uh, early capital but also to um you know product uh, sort of test and get that feedback um, Cheeky Panda is a great example. So they initially launched a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign, I think on um, crowdfunder.co.uk. Um, it was only a small amount, I think it was 10 or 15,000 um, pounds, most likely came from their own network. And essentially the model there is that, you know, you're raising, you're, you're, you're generating sort of uh, capital through donations and you're, you're giving a reward in, in exchange for that. So for lots of e-commerce brands, if you have a, a sort of a new innovative product, Kickstarter and Egogo might be a good platform um, where you can sort of launch that and essentially people will, um, you know, pre-subscribe to, to the product and they will, uh, you know, give the money up front um, to enable them to be the first to, to receive it. Um, after that point, I guess, you know, you could be looking at uh, SEIS rounds, equity crowdfunding, um, raising sort of the first 150,000 pounds 
for those who aren't aware of the, the SEI scheme, so Seed Enterprise uh, uh, Investment Scheme, so it allows businesses to raise up to £150,000. Uh, in exchange, the investors are able to claim back 50% of their tax bills. It's a huge incentive uh, for investors to come in early. Um, once they've, they've raised that, um, they can then sort of go on to, to raise uh, EIS, uh, which is another uh, sort of in, in incentive for investors to, to sort of get involved. Um, and I guess historically, there's always then been uh, a bit of a gap, I guess, from, you know, equity, equity sort of finance to, to debt funding. Um, and that's sort of where outfund comes in. Historically, it's been very difficult for early stage companies to be able to uh, take on debt funding because of the inherent risks, particularly without any securities or personal guarantees. Um, so outfunds able to, to sort of come in, we provide funding um, on an unsecured basis, no personal guarantees, and we can work with companies from as early as six months trading history, 10K uh, revenue, and then we're able to provide them with the capital need to invest in marketing and inventory. Um, and so I, I guess that's something that sort of fills in and then, you know, typically businesses may look to, to take on sort of more equity, uh, but they do need to consider uh, the cost of equity and, and the sort of dilution that, that sort of comes with that. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really interesting because we've had some questions coming in around, um, you know, how, how do people do it on no budgets, essentially, or, you know, how do you, how do you grow it? And I think um, what Outfund do is particularly interesting from point of view of you can um, kind of get some budget towards growing and putting into marketing um, without giving away equity at that point um, and almost kind of use that to prove your uh, business case um, uh, to kind of grow your business to the point where you're ready to then potentially do a bit of a larger raise um, where you could come to someone like Cedars where you could do um, you know we, we take raises anywhere from a hundred thousand pound you know up to eight million um, so it's it's about understanding I guess how you kind of grow your business to the point where it's right to then potentially do a bigger raise and then at that point you know is crowdfunding right for you um you know is a vc right for you and just kind of understanding what your options are um i think is really really important and mm -hmm. I, I know uh, me and emmy spoke about this a little bit in the past it's not just understanding what options are available to you it's it's having a, a plan a really strong plan in place isn't it, emmy around what you then do with. yeah i think it, i was i was just gonna say like i have seen clients and i've worked with clients that have done things like kickstarter and that i totally agree with rob that's such a great way to get to get um to get you know capital and also to to show investors that you've got people that want to buy your product but don't underestimate the fact that it's quite a lot of work that goes into that I, I, all the clients i work with who've done kickstarter campaigns i think from the outside you see um that people have, you know, sold all these products and it's amazing, but, you know, they have put a lot of work into that as well. So I think, you know, whichever route you go down, there is work involved, isn't there? You know, that it's it's not something, the money just doesn't doesn't just come. So, and one of the things I think yeah, is so important. Free money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think sometimes to an outsider, you think, oh, wow, that person's just, you know, smashed their Kickstarter campaign and they've trebled their targets. But I, I've worked with those clients and there's been so yeah. much work that's gone in. There's been a massive strategy and plan. There's been, you know, paid ads behind it. There's been PR campaigns behind it. Yeah. So I think um, I was talking to this, um, I literally just did an interview with an, an e-commerce business. He's relatively early stage earlier. They did Kickstarter, then they've done, um, then they've reached out to sort of angel investors and things like that and there is just you know there's a lot of work in those early stages um but that's not to say not to do it because obviously it's it's doable and there's lots of people doing it I think one of the things for me that is really important um is to really understand like we talked about the basis but to have a strategy and to have a plan and, and Emily you know as you, we were talking earlier you said you might well need to pivot you might well need to change um we started off with a media agency we we're always looking for new opportunities in the market and we ended up setting up a, a slightly different business so we pivoted slightly and that second business was much more successful we wouldn't have never known about it if we weren't running that first thing so you know no one's saying that you have to stick to stick to your plan and that you can't pivot but it is good to have a strategy and a plan and to know where you're going and I think that's so important for whether you're doing a kickstarter campaign you're definitely going to need it if you're doing um 
crowdfunding with someone like Cedars, and you're definitely going to need it if you're going and reaching out to VCs. They want to, to understand how you're going to spend your funding. They want to know that you've thought that through. They want to know that you can understand, you know, if you invest in marketing, what your return's going to be. They want to understand which channels you're going to use. And I think they just, you know, investors want the confidence to know that you've thought all those things through. Um, and so I would say, the people that are successful are the ones that have that strategy, that have that plan, that they've thought it all through. Yes, they might end up tweaking something in the plan. They might find that some channel works way better or that they hadn't realized that something was amazing. And, you know, they might have to change things slightly. But I think it gives a founder a lot of confidence to know that they've got a strategy and a plan and that they know where they're going. And I think it gives everyone else who's involved in the business, their suppliers, their employees and their investors that confidence as well. So I do think yeah. that's important to sort of get those basics done. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree. And it's interesting, we're talking about kind of the, the trial and error piece. Um, I think that's just really important generally when you're doing an online business. Um, there will be things that work for you, there will be things that don't work, but unless you kind of, you try it, um, then you, you kind of won't know as well. So, um, you know, uh, things that for Fitch that have worked really well um, have been things like increasing um, reviews. So like, th these are like little things that you, you don't necessarily have to put a huge marketing budget behind um, that will really shift the dial potentially really shift the dial um so for us it's kind of you know increasing the reviews increasing um things like uh the fear of missing out uh so doing kind of like the flash sales and but it was a lot of trial and error in terms of the the messaging and and what what you can do there's something called like an a b strategy or something isn't there where you can you set up two um almost two pages worth of kind of marketing content and then like redirect um to each one and then you see which one is performing better and then you can kind of build upon that um, I don't know if you guys have had experience with working in that with that kind of um yeah I think a b testing is done a, a lot of times and it it especially if you're doing things like paid paid ads, for example, you'll, you'll be doing lots of different tests. You'll be testing different creative, you'll be testing different messaging, you'll be testing different offers and all those kind of things. Um, and I think that is um, interesting to do early, early stage. And I think, Emily, what you were saying is, you know, marketing, well, we, you've got a hypothesis, you're saying, I believe that, you know, this is going to work or this is going to deliver a return and you're testing that. And, you know, no one knows the answer. You're, you're having to change things and you're finding that that channel or that creative works amazingly well and you're going to continue that and then you're going to test something else. So nothing's set in stone. And I think um, you've got to go into it with, with an open mind, especially as an early stage business, because you probably don't have any data. You know, yes, you can look at industry benchmarks, but if you don't know what your cost per acquisition is, you don't know what your customer lifetime value is, you don't know what your conversion rate is. And all those things will change over time as you improve your business. And someone had a discovery call with me the other day and they said, oh, what's the, what, what, what's the customer lifetime value going to be? And I was like, well, that totally depends on your industry, whether you've got a brand, whether people trust your brand, how long your business has been going, what products you're selling, whether you're upselling, whether you're keeping your customers. You know, when you're an early stage business, you don't have, you have very little data. And that's why I think we were saying at the beginning, go out and talk to people and get as much, you know, data of any kind, look at all your stats, look at your Google Analytics, but um, Rob will, you know, I'm sure you've got the same thoughts on this, Rob. It, you, it takes time to get that data, um, but you sort of need that data early on because you want that data to share yeah. with investors and things. So it is, it, you know, it's a process of testing all the time, isn't it? It's testing things and and being happy to be in that state of testing and to listen and to not always think like, I know what's right. I know what the customer wants. I'm going ahead this way. Because if you do that, that if that's not what the customer wants, you've wasted all your money. It's much better to actually test and find out what they want. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Amy. Um, and I guess just looking at some of the, the questions that have come through, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say a similar thing in terms of sales channels and marketing channels. You always want to be testing and, and not sort of relying on, on a single channel. Um, it will very much depend on the type of products that you're selling as to, you know, what sales channels you look at. Um, so, you know, do you want to initially start and, and launch your, your product on a marketplace? The, I guess, advantages of, of doing so is that you have that, that traffic, so it should be a lot easier for you to get off the ground and get those initial sales. 
but then you need to factor in the costs. As I said before, you know, Amazon seller fees, for example, are increasing in the new year. They're expensive as, as, as is. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the margins and you've know, worked with lots of clients in the past where um, it just hasn't worked for them because they don't have the margin there. Um, and then what I'd say as well is that don't just look at Amazon. There's lots of other marketplaces, sort of unknown, uh, some unknown sort of uh, um, marketplaces, um, some which are sort of up and coming. On by, for example, is, is a big one that we sort of do a lot work, work with. Um, Etsy, um, I think they're called Fi. They're actually uh, raised on on Cedars, so they sort of work with more sort of artisan um, type brands. What was that um, called? By like why? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And you've got not on the high street and things like that. I was going to ask you that. So, yeah. I, I suppose the good thing for um for brands there is there's no marketing costs as such, and people are actually bringing traffic to you. Um, yes, you are having to give away a, a chunk of that margin, but is that also a good way to get that sort of that feedback and to to know that your product is wanted and that you're creating something that people want without having to set up a, you know, invest in marketing and set up an e-commerce site yourself. Yeah, I'd I'd say if you don't have the investment then using a marketplace initially is probably the the best strategy. But I think long-term it's always good to eventually go back and, and be driving traffic to your own site and being able to own your customer base. Yeah, um, because that's... in the long run, you know, if you're building up that, that email database, you'll be able to engage with your your customers through email marketing and yeah. retargeting. Then it should be work out a lot cheaper than uh, than going through a marketplace and then just relying on that. And, and particularly as well, you're at the mercy of that marketplace. If something happens or they decide to increase the fees, then you just have to take it. Yeah, it's so important, isn't it, to be owning your own customer data? I think that's the thing. And like, yes, you can sell on Amazon, but then you're never able to go back and increase your customer lifetime value by building a relationship directly with that customer. Um, and you can't do the things like retargeting. So I suppose there's, there's ups and downs of both, aren't there? But essentially, long time, you're you know you're wanting a good a, a good proportion that probably the large proportion of it to be coming through your own channel, ideally, because then you're keeping all of it and you're also able to build better relationships with your customers. Yeah, sure. yeah, and I think you know that customer journey and understanding that customer journey, um, but like from start to finish through your website or or through your kind of e-commerce um, space, I think is in, just so important. Mm. Um, and it's stuff that you've kind of um, broached on before, Emmy, around you know the that importance of just that, that touch points with with your um customers and then constantly getting that feedback and, and reaching out to to them and understanding the the clear path to you know from the the sales all the way through to them actually purchasing it i so, think uh, um i just say on that point i think a lot of you know there's so much to do isn't there when you set up your business you're trying to get funding you're trying to do this you're trying to get marketing but sometimes you don't have the you haven't had the time or the opportunity or even thought to actually map out exactly every single touch point the customer has from when they land on your social platform to come through to your website, signing up for your newsletter, you know, buy the product. So I think even on Shopify, you can like personalize the the order forms and the invoices and the thank you pages, but people very rarely do. And then um, I think brands have got so much better at this now, but like, you know, whatever your brand stands for you need to stand for that every touch point so um i worked with a luxury sort of supplement um brand and their product was amazing their branding was amazing everything was incredible and but i so i ordered their product online and it turned up in a massive box like sort of that had been smashed around with the sticker stuff shoved on the side and i was like this product's amazing your brand's amazing you've got a premium brand but like what has been delivered doesn't align with your brand and one of my friends also ordered some and she actually contacted me she said you know that this product's like turned up and it's like smashed around in the box it looks really bad the box is way too big it's not very environmentally friendly um and so obviously like I could feed that back to them but I think sometimes we're so busy that we don't take the time to do those little things and no one's got the perfect customer journey especially not as a startup in big businesses they have whole teams of people doing this um, and the customer journey is probably something you're always going to be improving just to have thought what are all those different touch points are we on brand are we adding value are we being remarkable and are we you know talking to our customers in the way that you know we want to be thought about I think that's so important and don't underestimate the power of that because a good 
interaction you know that's when customers tell everyone about how amazing your product is because they love that experience they're having with you yeah at Fitch we started writing just a really simple kind of personalized note in in every order it's obviously not the best thing to do once you're you've got quite a lot of orders uh, unless you want to be up all night writing hand personalized notes but um, at the beginning I think it's a really lovely touch um, just to you know thank people for their order and handwrite you know from the founder and it's just a, I think it's a great way um, of engaging um, your consumer base and, and we saw a great uptake in people posting socials they're like oh what a lovely thing to do and um, it's just like those simple little touches um, that are maybe a little bit more personalized um, if that's the right thing you know, for your business that can just make a huge difference at the start um that doesn't cost a lot of money mm, i think that's the thing isn't it um where early stage businesses are short on time energy money how can you spend your time energy money money most effectively it's not always about spending loads of money you know initially i think there's lots of things that you can do that that, that don't involve spending lots of money you do need to spend money on paid ads to start you know getting traction um, I'm just thinking we've got lots of questions coming in so should we rattle through some of the questions do it um so we've got some in the chat and some in the Q&A so um I think we talked about the e-commerce one so for products on the luxury end of the scale um where you need to grow brand awareness as much as to get your products visible on affiliate networks um and your own e-com platform how do you advise new brands to achieve both on relatively limited budgets um it's so important isn't it that you're, you've got activity at every stage so you've got that awareness stage you've got the next stage now where they're sort of lead, leads or they've shown an interest in your brand then you've got customers and then you've got your loyal customers um, and your brand advocates and essentially if you're not doing anything in the brand awareness stage you're not putting anyone at the top of funnel so um Jeru is totally right you do need to do that brand awareness um I found for clients that get it right PR is amazing PR is a great way for um and it's also kind of trusted isn't it so um i work with an organic um deodorant brand and they had an amazing pr agency that were getting them amazing pr coverage and that um aligned with their paid ads was just working really really well because obviously the paid ads were sort of conversing them further down the funnel but the pr coverage was um was getting them lots of coverage so yeah i think that's the thing is you can't you, you do have to spend and, and it's tricky when you've got limited budgets you know how do you allocate your budget between those different um stages of the journey um but you definitely do need, do need to do some kind of um brand building work um i would say Jeru, some good stuff to do is to reach out to strategic partners people and this is for anyone actually everyone on this um on this masterclass find people who've got access to your audience who are selling something similar where your brand values align and, you know, do strategic partnerships with them. So you could do um, competitions, you could give each other a shout out on each other's newsletters, you could um, create some kind of joint offering. I think there's, you know, there's lots of things to be done there where you're tapping into somebody else's audience and they already know, like, and trust that brand. And when you do something together, then that's a really good fit. Um, you know, there's lots of great um, luxury um, brands that you could go with. Um, and also another thing you can do is you can reach out to publishers. You know, if you haven't got the budget to, to get a PR agency or to get a PR freelancer, though, I would kind of recommend that. Um, you can also reach out to, to publications. And a lot of p publications love dealing directly with the founders. Um, you know, they love that. So I would just encourage you to, to think about what, what are those kind of brand awareness activities where you're talking to um, people who've got a luxury audience and get in touch with them and, you know, ask them if there's either you can collaborate with them in some way or if it's some kind of publishing platform, if they can um, interview you so that you can talk about your story or, you know, find some kind of find some kind of way that you can work with them. 100%. I think um also, when you start working with kind of other founders of businesses in a similar space, um, ask them what's worked well for them or hasn't worked well for them. So share knowledge between you, um, you know, become part of the team together and figure it out together. So um, kind of that, I think that's a really good, good way of doing it. Networking is just so Networking important. is amazing, isn't it? Networking <laughs> is <laughs> the best. <Yeah. laughs> Schmooze everybody and get everybody to post about your product. <laughs> Marketing yeah. done. <laughs> okay what are some of the other questions Rob did you well that, that's maybe this is what good one for Rob what do you think are the most effective ways to increase traffic to your e-commerce platform and acquire new customers especially when you don't have bid marketing budgets so bid marketing budgets I'm presuming Nikki's talking about paid ads budgets 
Good question. Um, I think when when looking at you know sort of marketing mix, I think you you've got to go look at it and, and think about it in, in its most simplest form. So if you understand who your target market is, then you need to really think about okay, where are these people uh, you know sort of hanging out online, offline, and then think about how you can approach them. So um, you know in, even in this basic form flyering, you know we had one client that did a very successful flyering campaign. They knew exactly uh, where their customers were. They had a concentration in a certain postcode and decided to do a flying campaign. Worked out very successful for them and, you know, minimal cost. Um, we had another client that did radio ads. Um, you know, bizarre marketing channel when you think, you know, who listens to radio these days? Um, people still do. Um, and particularly, you know, he, he understood his target market, older uh, sort of target market. Um, and that proves out pretty well. And, and again, it, it was pretty cost effective. Um, so I think you just need to really understand, firstly, who the target market is, where you are able to approach them, and then decide on the, the relevant channels based on the budget that you have. And even if you decide that um, you, know, you want to start off small and then scale things from there, and that's always the best approach, because you know, if you're able to prove you know even with paid ads for example if you're able to do a small test with a few hundred pounds and prove that you're getting a strong return on ad spend then you can approach investors then you can approach you know potentially company like outfund if you have sufficient revenues um that there's there's sort of more options once you have that initial testing and you you can prove that you're able to generate profitable sales through whatever channel you decide to, uh, to use and Nikki, another idea is to work with um, partners on a sort of, a, you know, a rev show or affiliate basis. So if you can find people that have got access to your audience, you know, um, say, I think I know, Nikki, I think you might be selling wellbeing um, products, e-commerce products. But if you can find other sites or influencers or people that have access to your audience and they're happy to promote your business and your products um, in exchange for, um, you know, a a, a, um, a, you know a share of the order value or a, a cost per acquisition or whatever it is that you might decide then that's another way to go about it too but there's so many different options aren't there and I think it's about um, that's why I say the strategy and the plan is so important because like once you've done that like Rob says you've worked out your target market you know what they need what they want you've worked out where those people are hanging out you've worked out um, what media they're using and uh, and then you can target people in that way and something that I would just say is Social media is fantastic. Paid social ads allow you to target, you know, give, they give you really good targeting capabilities. And that's obviously why, um, you know, paid ads makes up a huge proportion of a lot of people's marketing budgets. But posting organic social media posts for many people is just one of the multiple touch points that a consumer needs to see. And I haven't seen many brands get, you know, if you're just posting on your social platform, you're probably not going to be getting the growth that you think that, you know, you would like to get. Um, you will find you need to be doing um, other, other ad advertising along with it. And I yeah. think what Rob was saying, the marketing mix, it's so important, isn't it? Um, one of my clients, they've just had an issue with their Facebook account. Literally, we don't know why. Um, we haven't been able to get hold of anyone at Facebook for two weeks. Luckily, they're not actually an e-commerce business because if they were, it all happened over Black Friday. But, you know, you can't just rely on one channel um, because yeah. like Rob was saying, you know, the algorithm changes or they change their um, their fees or you get your account gets disabled and you can't get hold of anyone and you've literally lost everything. So, again, that's that importance of getting the data so that you own the data as well. So you can actually be talking to your customers when these things go wrong. Yeah, hundred percent. Just just to, to add to that, Emmy. So um, we had one client, uh, cosmetics brand, and they just relied on on paid ads through Facebook. They were finding that their cost of acquisition was quickly increasing, got up to about thirty pounds, and they then decided that they couldn't sustain that. They didn't have the margin to to do so, and so they decided to change their strategy, and instead of selling you know, you as a sort of a normal e-commerce brand, you go to the store and you, and you purchase, you check out. They decided to do limited drops. So they would only be in stock for a couple of days per month. And so what you do there is you sort of build up um, that, that demand and you sort of increase that fear of missing out. And what it allowed them to do as well is that instead of sending traffic directly to their website um, as a sort of a direct response to allow people to buy, 
they decided to change their targeting campaign to a sort of a lead campaign. So they'll just ex get uh, interest and, and collect email addresses. Then they put together an email marketing campaign and they were able to get their cost of acquisition down to I think about one pound. So it's hugely successful. That's amazing. And you um, know why that is, Rob? Because there's so many more touch points in that journey, isn't there? When they are then, uh, they're then building a relationship with their customer through email marketing um, mm. and they're able to talk about the benefits and, and all those, the stories behind it. And I think, and obviously also tell these people that there's going to be a certain amount of time and they can get it. And that's, there, there's that FOMO, but that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And then I suppose uh, they've got I, all that data to market to. Exactly. So I think, again, it's just like trying to think outside the box. You know, everyone's using paid uh, ads on, on Facebook. The cost is increasing. It's getting more difficult in you know, the iOS update. So if you can think, you know, creatively about different ways that you can use Facebook advertising or use different channels, then it's always worth testing. Mm. Yeah. That's, I love that. That's brilliant. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, um, so, you know, it's, it's quite a difficult space if you're doing it for the first time right there's there's a lot of things that you don't know or you might not understand or different avenues you can go down um and obviously with the growth of um online sales we've seen this huge growth of agencies um and freelancers and stuff that support people some good some bad in my experience mm. um so I, I don't know if you, you guys have any tips around going about finding the right freelancers or the right agencies. I know one of the questions is here is, would you advise getting an agency to help start paid media, social media, um, or try it yourself first? Um, my question, my answer to that is try it yourself first and build it up um, and then potentially look at an agency. Um, but in terms of finding the right agency, um, what what are your guys thoughts on on going about doing that yeah good question so um quite relevant my sort of background i previously ran a um, paid marketing agency um, and at outfund as well we work with a number of agencies based in the uk and abroad um, and introduce them to to our clients um, now as you say there's lots of agencies out there there's good and there's bad um, my uh, sort of personal um, thoughts on this would be that at the early stage, if you have no experience of running paid ads, then it's usually good to bring on a professional. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be an expensive agency. It can be a freelancer, which can be more cost effective. You can use sites such as Fiverr um, to, to, to find a freelancer. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is setting up the ads and understanding um, who you are targeting and getting that early data. So I think once you do that, it's worth making that initial investment to get the ad set up and getting some uh, sort of testing going through and getting some early signs of uh, sort of traction and hopefully positive return ad spend. And then after that point, it, it should be easier for you to make those slight tweaks and to continue to manage the ads. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, you always want to use a professional because they have that experience. The advertising platforms are constantly changing and there's always going to be new um, strategies and techniques that you can apply. So it's always good to have someone who's you know, in the space, they work with other clients and they can share that experience. But if you don't have the budget, um, then you, know, you are going to be limited. So either try and do it yourself, but that's going to take a lot of time for you to learn. Um, if you do have some budget, then I would suggest finding a professional initially to get things set up and then hopefully you can take on and take over from that point. Mm. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I always say use an expert because, I mean, I ran a media agency and, you know, something like paid ads, Google ads, there's just so much that, you know, people say, oh, well, Google ads don't work or Facebook ads don't work. But it's like they probably won't work unless you are actually someone that is in the platform all day every day and you know exactly how to use it and you know how to do the AB you know ad testing and all of those things and you know I think clients people can waste so much money um, and yeah, time it's very easy trying. to spend money yeah it's so it's easy to spend money and then to say it doesn't work and also spend time and then you get stressed and I often say to my clients you know, you are the founders of your business. Your job is the vision, you know, the big strategic partnerships, what's coming next. Don't get involved in the nitty gritty. Um, I, I imagine, Emily, because you're, 
I think if you're mark if you've got a marketing background and paid ads is easy, is something that's easy to you, then obviously you know you can go and test it yourself. And I've got a client actually, and he has got a marketing background, and he has been doing some um, testing on Facebook ads. But a lot for a lot of people, the platform is so complicated, and they will you know it's yeah. you if you don't know the the you know the intricacies of how to work it, I think it will probably just really get you down. So I think Rob's advice is fantastic that for a lot of early stage founders paying three or four grand a month retainer which is probably what it is for a decent agency is too much so you're in that tricky situation where like you need to get your stats you need to show traction but you you can't do it yourself you can't afford a big agency so it is about finding a good freelancer and and you know that is quite hard to find a good freelancer who is really good so but like Rob said there are sites and and I think you know, you could, it, it is definitely a case of testing. And I'd also reach out, like Emily was saying, reach out to other founders, to people that you know who are the same stage as you, who are slightly ahead of you, and ask them if, you know, they're freelance or their agency, if they'd recommend them. Um, yeah. But I think it's, yeah, I would say with anything, if you can spend some money to invest in an expert who's done it, who's working with other brands, who's got industry insights, who's been doing it, who does it all day, every day, they will save you so much time and money. And probably express you on that journey to getting traction and to getting funding much much quicker yeah I would say it was key to find somebody who has done similar businesses like you've said Emmy um because they'll know how to touch base with that kind of you know customer base and what needs to be done in a similar remit um I think finding someone who doesn't have case studies or hasn't done businesses similar to yours um, is a bit of an unknown. So uh, maybe a little tip there is to try and find businesses that have worked on very similar projects. Yeah, you don't want to be paying them to learn about your industry, um, yeah, exactly. basically. So pay someone who already can, you know, who this is just what they're doing all day, every day. Um, exactly. Someone's saying, can we access the talk later? Yeah, I think we're going to be sending it around, aren't you, Emily? Yes, yeah, it goes um, on demand on the Seasons Academy. So um mm along with a lot of other awesome resources and tools. So do check that out, everybody, if you've not looked at it yet. Um, so somebody else was saying, how do you go about getting testers to try your initial batch of products? Um, I would basically reach out to people I know that already trust yeah. me. My friends, my family, my network, friends of friends, people at the school gate, people at wherever, you know, in my networking group. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, maybe maybe you have to offer it to them free, you know, initially. Um because they're doing you a favor because they're giving you feedback because they're giving you testimonials because whatever or maybe you can give them a really good um you know rate I've done this before where I was launching a new program and um, it's service-based it's different but it's the same thing and I basically said to people I'm launching something new I've done all this before but because you're the first people I want you to give me feedback and you get it for half the price and you know that's a no-brainer for everyone isn't it so I think so many so much of setting up a new business is just having the confidence to, to go out and talk to people and say can you help me or can you give me feedback or would you test this or do you know anyone that can help me I think the yeah. more that we ask those questions and and everyone does want to help don't they people want to help they Absolutely. want to see you know they want to see you be successful yes 100% um, and I think you know it's a great way at the beginning of the, the journey to bring on board brand ambassadors who are going to be with you for the journey um, and it's one of the great things about you know crowdfunding as well is it's, it's bringing on those people who are going to really be engaged with your business and be brand ambassadors and shout about your business so just engaging those people from the start like you know just reach out to people just say you know do I'm doing this business I would love to hear your feedback not just um you know friends and family reach out to buyers as well like you know get them involved at the start of the journey um get them influencing what you you, you kind of do so um yeah the more feedback the more data points that you get um I think is just so key to the early stages um of a business um and when we're, we're nearly out of time I'm conscious that we've only got a few more minutes left um so I guess to kind of look at wrapping up um his final thoughts on um from both you Robert Robin and Emmy about what your I guess top tips are or one thing you want to leave people with around how you kind of grow and scale an online business you want to go Rob? <laughs> sure um so I think we talked about it before, but I think most important thing, do your research, make sure you have the, the margins, 
um, and just make sure that you you do your your tests and, and you you experiment. Um, you know, as has been discussed throughout this talk, there's so many different things that you you can do, and it's so easy just to go with the easiest one and rely on a single sales channel or single marketing channel without exploring different options and understanding what might work. And it's really important to make sure that you have that mix. You don't just put all your eggs in one basket because as we've seen over the last you know, year, two years now, anything can, can happen. Um, and if you are reliant on a single sales channel or marketing channel, um, you know, it can be devastating for, for your business. Mm. Yeah, there's a really an interesting piece of research that I did on my mini um, MBA in marketing, which was showing that if you spent the same amount of money, I can't remember what the amount was. It, it, there's a point, you know, where you're spending a decent amount of marketing budget. If you spend it over two channels, it's I can't remember if it's 20 percent more effective than if you're just spending it on one channel. So it is important to have that marketing mix, isn't it? Um, should I do my, my quick thoughts is I suppose my big one would be. It takes courage to be a founder. There is so many ups and downs. It is there's massive highs, there's massive lows. You know, I've done it. We, I've done it myself. I see see it with my clients, and just to keep that, I think if you've got your vision and your purpose, and you know why you're doing it, and you know your customers want it, you've just got to keep knowing that not every day is going to be amazing, um, but there are going to. It is going to be great. It is really hard work, but it's worth it. And I think what Rob was saying, your numbers are so critical. So make sure you know those numbers. Make sure you're looking at your data all the time. Make sure that you're working on your cost per acquisition, your custom lifetime value, and you know all those things because that is kind of critical. To, um, critical. And don't underestimate the power of the customer journey because tweaking some points in the customer journey, you know, if you can improve your conversion rate by a small amount, um, that can make massive, massive um, changes to your profit. And often that hasn't, hasn't actually cost you any marketing money. So I would say those are things to think about, but um, good luck with it all. It's, it's, it's a fun journey. And, and I hope you all have success in your businesses as well. And do come and connect with us all on LinkedIn. Yes, please do. And I mean, um, huge thanks to, to both you, Emmy and Rob for spending the time with us today. And for everybody who's kind of joined us, it's, a, it's been great to kind of share some, some thoughts and thank you so much for all the questions. If anybody does have any more questions um, or, or feedback, like I said, please do reach out um, and and let us know um, and also please go on the Cedars Academy there's tons more resources and tools to help you kind of along along your journey um, and hopefully we'll see some of your businesses on Cedars raising at some point um, which would be awesome and also going to outfund for some money <laughs> which would be great so um, yeah bang on half past one smash it well done guys <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for spending your Tuesday lunchtime with us. It's been really great. And it's great to have all the questions as well. So thank Perfect. you for all of those. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Bye.